Welcome, everyone. My name is Jameson Freeman. I do have the uh, privilege of um, uh, serving on the Board of Governors here and chairing their Programs Committee. Um, I'm going to give some remarks to introduce our, our special guest this evening, um, who really needs no introduction. Um, but we're going to learn some new things. In addition to her gift of engaging so many um, for so many years, um, Ms. Reem Diane is also a best-selling author um, and, a and a leader in the so-called Death with Dignity movement, um, which advocates for the rights of individuals to decide their end-of-life situations. Um, these are often taboo and challenging conversations, but they are relevant to all of us regardless of age or health status. Um, her most recent book, When My Time Comes, which I hope all of you have a copy of, uh, was just released this February. So, let's get into it. Um, it is um, a distinct honor to welcome a native Washingtonian, former Washingtonian of the year, several times named one of Washington's most powerful women and most influential people, winner of the Peabody Award, the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism, among many, many other recognitions and acclamations. Um, Diane Reed. I'm happy to be here. I'm very happy you're here. <laughs> you suggested that really listening is fundamental. And you, I, I'd like to read a, qu a quote because you went on to say, might we not try to improve this endangered and fragile world of ours and take it toward a more stable axis of cooperation rather than shut out of our hearing those we label the axis of evil. And you want to say what the world needs now is, is great listeners, not great talkers. Where do you think we are <coughs> now with listening to each other. I think that talk shows should be called listening shows because I think talk show hosts do too much talking <laughs> and that they invite guests on to spend too much time promoting their own ideas as opposed to saying, you know, I really want to hear what you have to say. I really want to know what you are thinking. I really want to understand another perspective. So I, I, I'm really impressed with you for bringing that up. Thank you. I think I grew up with a head full of questions and, and asking questions of teachers in elementary school and junior high school and high school was just my thing. And when my mother was nine, was 49 and I was 19, she died. And she suffered greatly. And no one had truly indicated to me she was going to die. But when my mother was dying, my father didn't talk about it at all. In fact, when the doctor told me she was going to die, 16 or 18 months later, she apparently lived for about three years, I went out to the car where my dad was waiting, and I said, Daddy, 
mama's gonna die. And he was crying and he said, don't tell your mother you know. Don't tell your mother you know. The issue of choice um, at, at the end of life, um, why do you think it's so hard for us to listen to what people want? And, and or are people not being clear about what they want? Well, let me ask you, how many of you in this room plan not to die? <laughs> a few, a few. I have sad news for you. <laughs> I think that people do not wish to talk about the idea of death. For me, because I saw my mother die in such suffering and watched my husband die having had to starve himself to death, I think that without the idea of choice that you are within six months of dying, as my husband's doctor had determined. But when John said, I am ready to die, and doctor, I want you to help me, the doctor said, because we are in the state of Maryland, I can neither legally, morally, or ethically be of help to you. The only thing you can do is to stop eating, drinking, or taking medication. So I watched my husband for 10 long days go through that process and finally take his life into his own hands, because I'm 83 years old, and I have already indicated my preferences to my three-year younger husband and I, and... Trophy husband. <laughs> two and a half, and to my children and grandchildren exactly what I want. I do not want to suffer unnecessarily at the end of life. I don't think anyone does, nor do I want my family to see me suffer unnecessarily at the end of life. But I want to be clear to you if you want God to be the only one who decides, I support you a thousand percent. If you want everything that medical science can provide, I support you one thousand percent. That's your decision. My decision is that when my time comes, I want to be the one to decide, and I will be ready to go. There are 40 individuals that were interviewed that you listened to. I want to ask you about one of the last interviews. Um, Selwa Lucky Roosevelt. She said that, you know, basically she didn't want to have to go to Switzerland or something in order to um, die the way she wants. And she mentioned also that her doctor was one that was resistant to her wishes. I have changed 
doctors in order to make sure that I have a doctor who will support me. She was one of the few in the District of Columbia who supports medical aid in dying. Even when someone, like my father, has a DNR, has the instructions of DNR, given your position in this movement, this shift of consciousness, where do you think we are? It, it, it can be the individual's choice, but then there needs to be the ally within the medical system in order to have that choice uh, honored, in order to have that choice actualized. When we began that journey on the documentary, and then I began writing the book, there were three states. Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, which allowed medical aid in dying. Now there are nine plus the District of Columbia. So if I have no greater impact with this book and with this documentary, it is my hope that it will be to get each and every single person to whom I speak to talk with your next of kin, your spouses, your friends, your relatives, your doctors about what it is you want at the end of life. Do you want to say, enough, I've had enough. Or do I simply want to say, as my husband did, I've lost all my dignity. And I know if I continue to live on with Parkinson's, I will go even further into indignity, and I am not willing to do that. So my hope is that people will talk about death. This is also from the commencement address. You said, I believe each one of us can achieve progress one relationship at a time by quieting our inner voices of disagreement, of competitiveness, and attempts at one upsmanship. We honor then the voice of the speaker. The act of listening itself becomes an expression of generosity and compassion, which can lead to the creation of a new and more harmonious society. True listening is a form of spiritual hospitality by which we open ourselves to the ideas of others. We invite strangers to become friends and friends to become even better friends. So here's to listening more and here's to you, Diane. Thank you so much for being here.